You know, weeks ago I was on a plane and I was headed to Dallas for a conference. And so as I'm on this plane headed to Dallas for this conference, um, everybody kind of freaks out, right, at a certain moment because a gentleman, two seats up from me, he starts to have a heart attack. And so everybody kind of starts shuffling around, switching seats. You know, they come over the intercom. Is there any, you know, physicians on the plane? Can you come up, help us out? And so people started moving around. And so they come to me and they say, hey, Mr. Johnson, would you mind giving up your seat so a physician can get here? I'm like, great, yeah, sure. So I get up. And so for a minute, everything was all cool and all good. And the pilot comes over the intercom and he says, I'm sure you all are aware of what's transpiring and happening. So everybody kind of shakes their head, yeah. And he said, uh, because the gentleman is having a heart attack, we have to make an emergency landing. And people were peed off. Started moaning and groaning. Oh, man, really? And I'm like, man, God's about to die. Like, he can't stop. I'm like, I get it. People got things to do, places to be, and people to see. I get it. But somebody's life is on the line here. And when I thought to myself, when they landed the plane, I said, man, is that what we've gotten to as a society to where a destination is more important than another individual's life? Is that what we've gotten to as a society that goals, dreams, and aspiration is more important than another individual's life? Meaning the interactions with people now, we say, hey, how you doing? But we don't really mean, hey, how you doing? Meaning the interactions are totally off course in terms of seeing an individual through the lenses of something different and seeing them as this is a person's soul that I have the opportunity to impact instead of bypass. And so my destination is more important than this individual. And so they were moaning and groaning, not about the guy having a heart attack and he's fighting for his life and we got to stop to get him help. They were moaning and groaning because where they were going, they couldn't get there in the manner and the fashion of which they wanted to get there. And when I think about life, I think more times than not, I say, man, what, what is it, right? What is it that shifts the individual? And a lot of times when I think about it, I think at the core of what it is, it's the transaction. And when I say the transaction, it's when you give something a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of passion, a certain amount of dedication and commitment to a certain thing, and you expect something from that certain thing, and you don't get what you expected, the transaction is the problem. Meaning like if you're in a marriage and you're coming and you're dedicated, you're cleaning, you're cooking, you're washing clothes, and then you don't get the appreciation that you thought you were going to get sooner or later, it's going to be a problem. And I think more times than not, in life, people treat God like a Santa Claus. And then when they don't get the gifts that they thought they were going to get, it's a problem. Like I'm a firm believer that, I'm a firm believer that God redirects and maneuvers us when he has us in a, on a mission, right? And, and in the redirection, I think true courage is the ability to embrace what we don't understand. Because I know anybody can accept and embrace something that they do understand and that they know the end result. But I think true courage is when you find yourself in the midst of an opposition, piece of adversity or situation, and when you're in the midst of it, you're thinking, man, how did this happen and how did I get here? But you still have a certain level of perspective to say, even though I don't understand it, even though I don't like it, I can still trust God even though I can't trace God. And so when you speak about redirection, I'll never forget, like a couple days ago, you had the September 11th incident. Terrible incident, terrible situation. A lot of people lost their lives. Senseless act, right? And so I'll never forget, when I was at Tennessee, I was doing some research. I was in my master's program, and I was doing some research on the, on the situation. And I remember watching a particular clip of the situation, and I'm watching things happen, watching the camera sway back and forth, watching people jump out of a building, run out of a building. And I read an article, and in this article, they spoke about people that lives were spared because of situations that happened, and they were out of their control. And a lot of people didn't speak about it because a lot of people didn't know about it. So in turn, Pastor, they talked about this one gentleman that worked in one of the buildings. And that morning, I'll never forget, they said he was getting ready to leave home. And his wife came to him and said, hey, can you take our daughter to kindergarten today? And he responded, I really can't do it. I, I really need to get to work. And the wife says, can you please do it? I really need you to do this. I really need to get to work, is what he said. I really need to get to work. The wife responds again, please, can you take her to kindergarten? He accepted. 
and the timing of him taking his daughter to kindergarten when the building got hit because of that incident things transpired with him and his daughter and his wife and he couldn't make it in time the time of which he thought he was going to make it and because of that interaction it spared his life he couldn't control it. One gentleman, he got on a New Jersey turnpike, headed to the same building on a New Jersey turnpike. It was an accident. Something happened. It stopped, right? And because it stopped, and I'm sure he was on his way to work, and when it stopped, I'm sure he was fussing and he was mad as all get out. But he couldn't control the situation, and because he couldn't control the situation, his life was spared. One gentleman, they sent him to get some donuts or something. He went to get some donuts. He's coming out of the building. Somebody spills coffee on his shirt. He has to go home to change his shirt. And because of a situation that happened, him going home to change his shirt, it spared his life. One gentleman got a new pair of shoes, walking down the sidewalk, started to get blisters on his feet, had to go back home, change his shoes. Because he had to change his shoes, spared his life. Situations that happen that was out of their control and when you think about when things happen the first thing we try to do as individuals how can I control it and how can I manage it and if I can't control it and manage it now I'm frustrated and I'm mad about it in the words of an older gentleman he told me one day he said young man you can't speed up the river and you can't slow it down at a certain point you got to have some faith How many times do we get redirected and we don't know what we're being protected from and we're fussing and we're mad about it? Like, it's an amazing thing. Now when things happen, my perspective is totally different. Like, when I'm in the airport and my flight get delayed and people go to fussing and I see them getting mad and, you know, you could be by them and they're getting mad and you almost get mad. And I'm like, I got to walk off. They about to make me mad, right? But when I walk off, I'm like, God, what are you protecting me from? Like when situations happen now, I'm, I'm like, life, what are you trying to teach me right now? Like, God, what can I extract from this situation since I don't like it and I don't understand it? I'm sure lessons and blessings, stages and phases, I'm sure it's something in it that I can extract and apply to some area of my life. James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith goes on to produce perseverance, and perseverance must finish this race so that you may be complete and lacking nothing. In other words, we got to go through something in order to become the individuals that God wants us to become. So redirection, bring it. Opposition, bring it. Not saying that every day I wake up, I'm like, adversity hit me. No. Oh, no. But when it comes, I look at it different. Like I ask people one question all the time. I'm like, what is it you want? I'm like, what do you want? People, oh, I want money. I'm like, cool, all right, yep. I'm like, but the true measure of your wealth is if you got it and you lost it, then how much would you be worth? I mean, how much is your character and your integrity worth? Because that's the most valuable possession that we got. And the thing I love about character, every individual in here, when we were born into our respective hospitals, nobody came into our room and said, hey man, you, you automatically inherit character. It's something that we gotta fight and we gotta build it every single, it's just like the Christian walk, the journey. You gotta fight and you gotta build it every single day and it's a big difference between professing to be a Christian and actually living as a Christian. And so in my life, right, I, the biggest redirection of course came in 2006, right? But at every phase of my life, I got redirected, redirected, but God also maneuvered me, right? And like I said before, I think when God has you on a mission, right, God will maneuver you through certain situations, and even when you can't stand, can't stand it or understand it, God will still maneuver you to get you to the destination that he's trying to get you to. And I used to wonder as a kid, like, man, why am I growing up in this certain environment and I'm not getting touched? Like, I'm coming up in an environment where people are getting murdered. I'm coming up in an environment where they call that little Vietnam. I'm coming up in an environment where people are doing drugs, people doing everything. I'm coming up in an environment where I got robbed, right? But nothing happened to me. And I'm coming up in this environment in this two bedroom home with 14 people. And at every phase of my life, God sent somebody. And when he sent them, the only difference between me 
and some of my friends that I grew up around, when he sent them, I was smart enough to listen. In other words, young people, it takes 21 years to become 21. No matter how talented, how brilliant, how smart, and how powerful you are, it's just certain things you won't understand until you get experience in order to understand it. And I first fell in love when I, with football. I was seven years old. I was playing in the street. Bloody, pure passion. Not too much smarts, but passion, right? And God sent the man one night. Never forget it. Me and my cousins out there getting after it in the street. Light pole to light pole. Street lights pop on. Ten minutes before we had to go in the house. We're trying to get our last ten minutes in. This blue pickup truck comes down the street. I back out on one side, walk three younger cousins back out of the street on the opposite side, walk, and we're trying to get this truck by. I mean, come on, man, so we get out 10 minutes in. The truck is just cruising. He's looking at us, we looking at him. He pulls on the sidewalk. I'm like, oh, here we go. He gets out of the truck, first white guy we'd ever saw in our neighborhood. Every drug dealer on the corner took off running, automatically assuming he's a cop, right? <laughs> nicest guy in the world, though. Nicest guy in the world. I still talk to him till this day. He walked over, man, y'all want to play football on grass? I'm like, man, I would love that. Where you been, brother? He like, go and get your guardian. I go in the house, my uncle JJ is there. I'm like, uncle, you please come and talk to this guy. Uncle comes outside, guy extends his hand. Hey, man, Trey Hurst, don't even supposed to be in this neighborhood. Drop the kid home, three blocks up, roll down, just see what it was like. In his exact words, I see these knuckleheads playing tackle football in the street. He said, I run a league across town. Think if you bring him out, sign him up, great opportunity, really help him. My uncle responds, sir, we greatly appreciate it. He said, but I hate to inform you, we just don't have the money for anything like that. And he pointed at me, he said, his mother, she's working a double shift at Wendy's right now. She definitely don't have it. And he said, the other three, their fathers are in and out of prison. So it's definitely not happening. That's why they're in the street. Coach, without any hesitation, says, I tell you what, you bring him to the park tomorrow, I'll pay for it. Didn't even see us play. He just see us out there tossing the ball around, and he turned his truck up, and he just seen some kids. Meaning he didn't see no moves. He didn't see my little spin off. He didn't see none of that, right? My uncle said, okay. Uncle brought us to the park the next day. I'm standing in line because I'm, I'm intrigued by this guy. I'm standing in line beside him. I watch him take cash out of his own pocket, pays for me and my three younger cousins to play. And then my family, the only people that went to college was me and my three younger cousins paid for in that street that day. But I wanted to understand the man behind the actions. Because it wasn't something that he did just for us. He did it for anybody that he felt was in need, meaning it was his essence and who he was as an individual. It wasn't a front. And so most nights, I would be in the park late, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, waiting on my mother to get off the shift at Wendy's. She worked right around the corner one night. She couldn't make it. She called, Coach, Coach, can you take Inky home? I can't get off work. He said, sure. He said, Inky, I'll drop you off last. You live right by Turner Field. I was five minutes away from Turner Field. And so we get to my house. I get out of his truck. I'm standing on the sidewalk and back to my house. And Coach is looking out of the window. And uh, he says, all right, Inky, catch you later. And I said, Coach, can I ask you one question? He gets out of the truck. He comes around. He said, what you got, Ink? I said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful when I ask this. He said, what you got, man? I said, um, why do you do what you do? I said, because cats around here, man, they, they don't live like that. Like they, it's always a catch-22 when they do something for you. It's not genuine. It's not pure. And I said, why do you live your life that way? And he said to me, son, I'm going to tell you something. And he said, I don't want you to ever forget it. And in his simplicity, it was yet profound when he said to me, as long as you make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, God will make sure that your life is okay. And he got in his truck and he left. And the way I processed it was, as long as everything I aspire to get, everything I want, everything I'm connected to, and everything I'm a part of, as long as the purpose is always greater than me, I'll be fine. In other words, as long as I'm on a mission, like dreams and all that, that's cool, but dreams is what I want to do. My mission is what God has put me on this earth to do. And so if I'm connected to my mission, God will find a way to maneuver me through certain situations to get me to my destination to accomplish the mission that he has for my life. And so two years later, I come in contact with this amazing eighth grade math teacher and basketball coach. Me and my wife was in this class. He told me one day, you're going to marry that girl. I said, you lost your mind. And he walked my wife down the aisle at our wedding. 
But this gentleman, one day after school, he comes to me, and I'm on a corner in my neighborhood, and he rides up in a red Dodge Ram pickup truck. And I'm standing on the corner with my uncles, and he rolls down the window, and my uncle tapped me, he said, Inky, who is that? I said, man, that's my eighth grade math teacher and basketball coach. He said, what does he want? I said, I don't know. The coach asked me, Inky, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm hanging out. He said, no, you didn't hear me. What are you doing out here? I said, I'm hanging out. He said, get in the truck. We'll take you home. I get in the truck. We ride down the block. I get out. He said, hey, man, uh, I just want to tell you, Ink, you're better than that. I said, better than what? You're better than that. I said, man, listen. I said, you see that corner you just picked me up from? My uncle wears three forks, T-shirt. He'll just be coming in the house in the morning from standing on the corner selling drugs. And you'll see me in the morning in your class in that three or four-inch T-shirt. I'm like, man, so not trying to hear that. Most mornings, me and my cousins come to school to your class. Like, I hadn't even eaten yet, man. So bump that. He said, oh, you one of those, right? You want a question. He said, man, I'll tell you what. Since you want to question what I'm saying to you, he said, I'll see you in the morning. I'm going to pick you up in the morning before school. I said, yeah, whatever, man. Next morning, I'm sleep on the floor. Me and my cousins used to sleep on pallets. My mom comes shake my shoulder. I look up. I say, yes, ma'am. She said, your eighth grade math teacher and basketball coach at the door. I said, man, he's serious. I go to the door. He said, get in the truck. Come on, man. Let's go. I get in his truck. He said, here's the deal. He said, here's how I'm going to help you defeat this. This environment. Here's the game plan. Here's how I'm going to help you beat this, right? I said, what you got? He says, every morning. I'm going to pick you up before school until you graduate high school. And he said, I'm going to play you in a game of one-on-one basketball, and I'm going to sit you down on the bench, and I'm going to make you recite a proverb. I said, let's do it. We would play basketball. He would sit me down on the bench, read me a proverb. I will recite the proverb until one morning we're in the gymnasium. The principal, Dr. Jackson, comes in, and he says, DeMarco Mitchell. DeMarco stood up. He said, yes, sir. He said, I heard you've been giving Inquarius Johnson proverbs. He said, yes, sir, I have. He said, stop it or I have to fire you. Without any hesitation, my teacher said, well, you're just going to have to fire me because his life is worth it. And he had three kids of his own between him and his wife. They had adopted three more from that same school system because they knew they didn't have anywhere else to go. And he was on a teacher's salary. And I said, man, if he's willing to put the way he feeds his family on the line for me, little scrawny kid from the east side of Atlanta, I got to give him everything I got. And I go into the summer of my eighth grade year, about to be a freshman in high school, and everybody knew I wasn't a little athlete, and so I'm telling you about God maneuvering me. And so the summer going into my freshman year, everybody says to me, hey, Inky, do you want to go to college? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to college. They said, what high school are you going to? So I'm going to Crim, right up the street from my house. They were asking me again, do you want to go to college? I said, yeah, I'm going to college. They said, nobody goes to college from Crim. They asked me the question so much, I started to ignore it until one day I'm in a car with my mother and we're a stoplight away from Krim and my mother turns and looks at me and says, son, do you want to go to college? I say, yes, ma'am, I'm going to college. She said, what high school do you want to go to? I said, I'm going to Krim. You're acting like you're going to put me in private school or something. She said, Inky, um, the chances of that happening, slim to none. Like, I'm not trying to crush your dreams, but I can't play with your future. I said, mom, just give me a shot. I think I can do it. I said, yeah, Inky, but it just doesn't happen. I said, just give me a shot. The first day I get to the school, I see why everybody said what they said. There was a cop at every single door, metal detectors. And as soon as you get there, you got to put your arms out, head to the ceiling, search you from the crown of your head, bottom of your feet, come back up your body, and I'm still hype. All right, so I get up to the door, head up. My man starts searching me. He gets to my feet. He's coming back up my body. His exact words were, What's your plan, little man? I said, oh, man, I'm going D1. I'm going to college. He says to me, you'll probably go to cell block D1. And he goes to walk off. And I walk with him. I like it, right? I tap his arm. He turned around. He said, no, I know about you. And I said to him, no, man, you got the wrong guy. Sarcasm kicks in. No, I know about you. He said, you had two uncles coming to the same place, great little ball players. I said, yeah, they could play ball. He said, people talked about him, kind of like they talk about you. I said, yes, sir. He said, aren't they serving 13 and 40 years at the federal penitentiary, not even 10 minutes away from these front doors? I said, yep. He said, exactly. Apple don't fall far from the tree. You'll probably end up in cell block D1. 
He went to walk off. I walked with him. I tapped his chest. He turned around. I said, I'm telling you. I don't know who you've been dealing with, but you got the wrong guy. He said, we'll see. I said, we will. And when I got my scholarship from Tennessee and got back to Krim High School, the first person I went to see was that cop in the lunchroom. I slipped my paper across the table to him. He stood up. He asked me one question. He said, how did you do it? He said, the reason I said it to you, he said, don't get it twisted. You thought I was trying to break you. I wasn't. He said, I'm here every day. I stop fights every day. I stop kids from bringing guns, drugs into the school every day. He said, but I heard the language so much, son. He said, I've seen so many kids step up to me and say the same thing. And they end up dropping out their freshman year. And so I wanted to challenge you to see would you retreat or would you step up to me and fight for the thing that you said you wanted? He said, I just said it to see what you're willing to fight for, what you said you wanted. Like, I'm intrigued in life how when a person say they want something or a person say, man, I'm going to have this incredible, phenomenal life. And the only thing it takes is for the circumstance to change. And when the circumstance change, they forget everything that they once spoke or everything they once spoke now means nothing to them. Right? The words that they spoke about a certain situation. I'm intrigued by that. Right? How a circumstance can take that away. Like, I, I understand this about life. In life, people don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. But when the purpose is intact, when the mission is intact, when it's about something greater than themselves, the opposition, the adversity, and the challenges are part of the journey. When things happen to redirection, it's a part of the journey. It makes it even sweeter in the end when the purpose is greater and about something greater than you. That's why it's so easy to spot selfish people. That's why it's so easy to spot people that's just out for their personal gain. It's easy because all it takes is for something not to go the way that they thought it was going to go, and now they no longer want it. But when you find a warrior for Christ, when something doesn't go the way that they want it to go, they say, let's regroup, let's re reroute, and let's get going. Let's finish what we started. The mission is different. And so when I got to Tennessee, it was Mayberry for me. I'm like, man, y'all get five pair of cleats. You get a salad bar. Guys still are complaining. I'm like, unbelievable. Y'all complaining. And I come into my junior year, and I'm about to get exactly what I wanted. About to get this thing called NFL. <laughs> you know what it really stands for? Not for long, right? That's what it really stands for, right? And I'm... 10 games away from this dream that I wanted my whole life, right? This thing that I've been working for my whole life. My whole life is dedicated to this one game. I'm up Saturday mornings, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, two miles to a fire station, two miles back home. I'm in the park, 9.30, 10 at night, doing everything in my life surrounded the game of football. I'm sitting at home at night. I'm throwing balls up to the ceiling and I'm catching them different type of ways trying to see if a receiver was to check me if I wanted to catch an intercept like everything revolved around this game and I finally get in the position in my life to where now I'm 10 games away from it I got the paperwork that states I'm about to be an NFL draft pick NFL on top of the paper Inky Johnson projected top 30 automatic multi-millionaire now all you have to do the hard part's over just play the next 10 football games Ink, you, you, you made it and I go out in a silly game against Air Force, two minutes left, and I go to make a tackle that I can make with my eyes closed. And I hit this guy, and as soon as I hit him, I knew it was a problem, but I didn't think it would be this type of problem. Like, you know how when things happen, you're like, ah, I didn't expect that, but I don't think it's going to be anything too crazy. And when I hit him, every breath in my body left, my body goes completely limp, I fall to the ground, I blacked out, my eyes open, I'm still not you know, too concerned, because it's football. I told Pastor, I never thought about a career in an injury. You have injuries within the game. When my eyes open, guys run over, ink, let's rock, man, let's go, let's finish them off. And I'm like, I, I can't. They're like, what do you mean you can't? You're a starting corner, get up. You can nurse your injury after the game, man. I'm like, no, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. It's a shock, neck to my toes. I can't feel anything. Shock leaves, it stays in my right arm and hand. I'm like, maybe I got a bad stinger. They put me on the spine board, willing me off the field. Doctor says to me as he's walking beside me, I don't know how you're still alive, son. You don't have any pulse. Maneuver. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there. I'm like, Pops, I laid it on him, right? I put it on him, right? My dad's like, yeah, but I think you got the worst part of this one, eh? 
Doctors say, we're going to take you over, run a couple tests, bring you back into the room, everything will be cool. They run the test, they bring me back into the room, mom comes in, kisses, prays, son, you'll be fine. She's going to walk out, doctors rush in, head boy says, hey ma'am, got to rush him back to surgery, he's about to die. And I look at him and I want to ask him, like, man, you can't use another word? Like, use a synonym, brother. How y'all say die? Like, you sure die, man? And he could tell from how I'm looking at him that I'm questioning. And he says to me, you ruptured a subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. If we don't perform this surgery tonight, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. From seven years old to 20 years old, boiled down to one moment. The sacrifice, the dedication, the commitment came down to one moment. And the next morning I woke up from that surgery, the NFL on my scale of life, that big. SEC championship, that big. Cornerback, that big. I was embarrassed. I'm sitting there and people coming into my room like, Inky, man, um, I'm sorry about what happened to you. And I'm saying to myself, uh, man, Inky, you really messed it up this time. Like, man, that's really the only thing you wanted, huh? Like, you just thought because you grew up in this um, so-called hood, two-bedroom home, 14 people. Like, the only thing you really wanted was the NFL. That's it. I'm like, man, you limited God to that? Like, life holds no substance, no value. Like, efficient but not effective. I did things right, but I never did the right thing. And now the thing I placed my identity in, now it was gone. That's why I laugh at people when they say, man, if I could just get this, I'll be... Man, if I could just get this position, I'll be, woo. Man, if I could just get this amount of money, I'll be, I'm like, woo. But what happens even if you get it or you don't get it? What happens when God says yes and no? Like, do you have the ability to accept what you don't understand? Can you still see God's plan when it didn't go the way that you thought it would go? Can you handle when things get off course? I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, man, I'm eight games away and God is redirecting me. And I'm like, God, just let me get to the NFL, then redirect me. Like, let me get the contract, then redirect me so I can help my family. And God is like, no, son, I need you to really go that way. And I'm like, you sure? Like, man, I need to go this way. He's like, no, I need you to go this way. I got something greater for you. Now, it might take a little longer to manifest, but I got something even sweeter. Like, I got something more fulfilling. I got something more rewarding. I got something, son, that's going to carry you for the rest of your life. Like, it's an amazing thing. I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing when one day I'm backstage and I got the same feeling that I got when I used to be in the tunnel before I was running out of Neyland Stadium. And I said, thank you, God. Same feeling. And I met a gentleman one day in West Town Mall in Knoxville, and he came up to me and he was crying. It was me and Eric Berry. And when he was crying, I'll never forget, he said, I saw a little clip on the news, and I saw you laughing about what you went through. He said, I was going through something, and that really helped me. And he left. And when he said it, I walked off, and I said, God, if people view me in this way, I have to take myself a little more serious. Like, God, if this is what I represent to people, I got to take myself a little bit more seriously. Like, God, if I'm going to be dealing with you and I'm going to be connected to you, and this is what I rep, I got to take myself a little more serious, right? And a guy told me, Inky, if you're going to make plans with God, be sure to make them big. I said, I got you. And I thought it was over after football got redirected. My life got redirected two, three more times before I even fell into my purpose and my mission and what I was supposed to be doing. It got redirected two, three more times. I'm thinking I'm going to be a coach. Just like every guy when he finishes the game. And I'll just coach. God's like, no, you ain't. I'm talking about people trying to give me positions. People telling me, hey, man, here, name your position. Name it. Write your job description. Put your, put your price on it. Like people are trying to give it to me, and I'm praying, and the Lord will not give me peace. I'm like, Lord, this is eat. Nope, no peace. I'm like, well, maybe I'm supposed to go back to Atlanta and work in my neighborhood at the rec center. I'm calling the guy, guy answered the phone. He like, Inky, you should have left yesterday. I got you the job. I get to Atlanta. I call the guy. He don't answer the phone. 
I email him, he don't reply. Now I'm in Atlanta with my daughter, my wife, and we're living with my wife's grandmother in a small little one bedroom home, and my daughter is sleeping in a wagon that somebody bought her for a birthday because me and my wife couldn't afford a bed, and my wife is pregnant with our son. And I don't have a job. And I always tell a story about when my faith was fortified and my life went to another level was the only thing I had at that moment was a prayer and a book. And the prayer that I prayed was, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do. Exact prayer. I don't know what you want me to do. But people keep coming to me telling me, speak. Inky, you need to speak. And I'm like, I'm not speaking. Like, I don't want to do that. People coming, Inky, you need to speak. I'm like, no, man. I want to just work up here, create a couple of curriculums, leadership stuff for kids. I'll do that. Somebody come, Inky, you need to speak. I'm like, no, man. And God brought me to the point where I had nothing, and I was on my knees, and I said, Lord, listen, I don't know if this is what you want me to do, but I submit, and let's rock. And the next morning, I woke up, I had my book I had written, and me and my boy Jeff, and I wrote it, and I got up, and I looked at my wife. I said, I'm going to take this book to Oprah. My wife looks at me and said, oh, cool. Do you know Oprah? I'm like, nope. Hey, you know anybody that worked with Oprah? I'm like, nope. You know anybody at Harpo Studio? I'm like, nope. She said, you sure? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, go for it. I took off to go to Chicago in my truck, same truck I drive now. I got my little 2X suit on. You can see I'm nowhere near the 2X, right? I'm driving, I got about $200 to my name. I'm praying, like, Lord, don't let me get a flat, don't let nothing happen, because I'm done. And so I get up to Chattanooga, I call my buddy Jeff. Jeff is in Knox, he's an attorney. Jeff picks up, I said, Jeff, you ain't gonna believe it. I'm going to Chicago to meet Oprah. Jeff said, oh, Inky, you know Oprah? I'm like, nope. Jeff immediately says, Inky, I know you're a highly ambitious person. I need you to hang up, think this through and call me when you get to Knoxville because the chances of that happening are a long shot. Now I want you to be disappointed. I get to Knoxville, I call Jeff. Jeff picks up. He said, you still going? I said, yep. He said, stop by and pick me up, man. I just don't want you to be too down when it doesn't happen. I pick him up. We get to Chicago that night. Jeff gets to the hotel. He said, Inky, you want me to get you a room? I said, no, I just sleep on a little cot, man. Get up the next morning. Jeff says he's going to work out. I said, I'm going to go to the front desk. He'll get some information, try to get to the studio. I'm looking at Jeff. He's looking at me. I'm getting the information. I go to take off, and Jeff says, Ink, wait. He said, man, let me go change. I'm going to go with you. You know, I just don't want you to be too let down. I said, all right, cool. He said, we'll take a cab. We take a cab over. We get to the block, and it's massive. People everywhere. They're going, coming in and out. So we get out. Jeff says, I'm going to go to this coffee shop. He said, Ink, I'm sure this won't be long, right? And so I got my book. I got my suit. It's hot. Every door that opened, I ran in it. I'm, hey, man, Inky Johnson drove from Atlanta. They're like, get out of here. I'm like, man, Oprah people are rude, man. I thought you was nice. You give away cars like you're rude. <laughs> so after getting kicked out of like four doors, I go to the back of the building. I sit down, I put my back on the building, I look up to the sky, and I'm like, God, man. I thought it was you. Like, I'm like, man, my wife gonna chew me out, man. And I get up and I walk around the side of the building. Homeless gentleman sitting there, I sit beside him. He said, how are you doing? I said, man, I've seen better days. He said, how are you? He said, I'm great. I get up. I look down the sidewalk, and at this moment, there was nobody but Oprah and a security guard. Talking about nobody else. She's walking toward me. I'm walking toward her. I get a couple of feet away. I stop. She grabbed my suit. She said, hey, that's a nice suit. I said, thank you. I said, I drove from Atlanta. I wanted to get you my book. I said, oh, cool, great. I said, would you mind taking a picture? We take a picture, and we're going to walk off. She said, I got to get in and do my show. I said, all right, thank you. And I'm going to walk off, and her security says to me, said, uh, hey, young man, come here. I stopped. I went back to him. He said, I just want to tell you something. He said, what just happened never happens. He said, now, I don't know what's going to come out of it. I don't know book club, show. I don't know about any of that. He said, but I just want to make sure I tell you what just happened never happens. I said, thanks. So I leave. I start to put the picture on social media, send it to my friends, everybody's reaction. You going to be on a book club? You going to be on a show? Is she going to interview you? What's going to happen? I'm like, I don't know. I really don't care. 
I'm like, what just happened? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I'm like, God, are we moving like that? Like, God, are we really moving to the point where I can get up in Atlanta, Georgia, look at my wife, don't know nobody in Chicago, don't know nobody on Oprah's staff, and look at my wife and say, I'm going to meet Oprah. I got a certain level of faith that I'm going to meet Oprah. And God puts me face to face with Oprah and puts the book in her hand. I said, God, let's go. And so now I live my life a certain type of way according to what God has done. I live my life a certain type of way according to the power that I know the Lord possesses. I live my life a certain type. Like when I go to the Lord in prayer, I go bold. And every time I go bold, I'm so thankful that that's not me and my Lord's first time communicating. And people have the nerve to ask me all the time, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? You got a paralyzed right arm and hand. I'm like, if you only knew and if you only saw the works that God has done in people's lives around me, what he's done in me, yeah, it's great, it's cool. But what God has done in the people's lives around me, like, you can't put a price on that. Like, at a certain point, like, what is it really about? Like, and I know the initial reaction when we go through things is to say, man, why did this have to happen to me? And it's an honest reaction. Because sometimes good people go through some crazy stuff. And some of the things we go through, I'm going to just be real, it's not, a, it's not a scripture for it. It's not. You can't go, hey, go to Romans 2-2. They're like, what? It's not. But this is what I've understood. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. And so when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. The only thing I ask of you as talented, as brilliant, as powerful, as beautiful as you are. Never allow life to make you forget why you started in the first place. Meaning that first time you said, man, I'm riding with Christ, let's go. That first feeling you got, like that first interaction, that first connection you got, like when you first got it. It's like when people say at, at the beginning, everybody is excited, everybody is on fire, but at a certain point you hit something along the journey and it's going to test that level of commitment. At a certain point, you're going to hit something that's going to test that level of faith. And my definition of commitment was always staying true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Like, am I going to stay true to my beliefs and my core and my essence of who I am as an individual, even if I get a paralyzed right arm and hand? Am I going to stay true to it, even if my little career that I thought I was going to have disappears? Am I going to stay true to it, even if one day I'm in a football game, the thing I love to do, the thing I have been practicing my whole life, and then one moment it gets wiped out? Am I going to stay true to it? Because depending upon if I'm going to stay true to it, a lot of other people's belief in their Christian journey is predicated upon that and my belief in my Christian journey. In other words, I've seen a lot of other people say, Inky, I want to give my life to Christ, not because of something that happened with me, but because of something I've seen happen to you. And so when ESPN comes to me and say, Ink, you wouldn't be in the NFL right now? I'm like, if you only knew. If you only knew my father got saved because of my injury. If you only knew, my three boys that went first round to the NFL, all of them got saved. If you only knew. If you only knew, my mother, the level of her faith, like, if you only knew. Like, I just seen God do some things through the injury, and I'm like, man, I just, every day I wake up, I just try to stay out of his way. I'm like, should I step here, should I not, right? And to my athletes in the room, a specific word. The game of football is a platform. Sports is a platform, man, that God has provided to do something incredible. Like, never think that you're God's gift to the game. God has gifted you to be able to play the game. And with every opportunity we get, we should always give God the glory. I'm going to leave you with this. Cause I'm a Baptist, right? So I get going, fire get rolling, right? I'm gonna leave you with this. We already know what to do when God says yes. We already know what to do when we get blessed. We already know what to do when our prayers get answered. But the question that I have for you in this rhetorical, what will you do when God says no?